A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour is come. But when she has brought forth the child, she remembers no more the anguish. For joy that a man is born into the world. So also you now indeed have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no man shall take from you. John chapter 16, verse 21 to 22. Today we celebrate the birthday of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Saint Anne and Saint Joachim are the parents of Mother Mary. So to say, they are the grandparents of Jesus Christ our Lord. In John Paul II's encyclical, Christi Fidelis Laici, number 40, it says, God truly became man in Jesus and entered into a human family that included not only his mother Mary and father Joseph, but their parents and their parents all the way to Adam and Eve. Like all of us, Jesus was born into the web of relationship, the cradle of life and love that is the family. Becoming parents seemed like a far off dream for St. Joachim and St. Anne. Tradition holds that these saints struggled with infertility and were childless for decades. Like other barren couples in the scripture, such as Abraham and Sarah, Elkanah and Hannah, a sterility was a great burden to saints Joachim and Anne, and even a hindrance to their participation in community life. A story told of Saint Joachim relates that he wanted to offer sacrifice in the temple but was turned away because of his childlessness. He retreated into the mountains to air his grievance with God, and during this time, both he and his wife received an angelic prophecy of Anne's pregnancy. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, we can picture her thanking God in the same words used by Hannah when she became a mother. My heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in my God. I have swallowed up my enemies. I rejoice in my victory. The barren wife bears seven sons, while the mother of many languishes. What is so significant about Mary's birth? Hers is a real cause for exaltation of the world because she was born a saint. Others were born with original sin. Mary was born a saint and a great saint, for great was the grace with which our Lord enriched her from the beginning, and great was the fidelity with which Mary at once corresponded with it. In the book Glories of Mary, written by St. Alphonsus Liguori, we read, Men are accustomed to celebrate the birth of their children with joy and fasting, as John 16 verse 21 to 22 tells us, but rather ought they to weep and give signs of grief and mourning, considering that these are born not only destitute of merits and of reason, but moreover infected by sin and children of wrath, and therefore condemned to misery and death. But with reason do we celebrate with feast and universal praise the birth of our infant Mary, for she came into the world an infant in age, it is true, but great in merits and in virtue, Mary was born a saint and a great saint. Mary was uniquely conceived and born without original sin. In 1854, Pius IX's bull in a fabulous deus solemnly proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. It reads, We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which asserts that the Blessed Virgin Mary, from the first moment of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, was preserved free from every stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God, and for this reason must be firmly and constantly believed by all the faithful. 
Pius IX's definition of Mary's Immaculate Conception includes the following tenets. First, freedom from original sin. Mary's complete preservation from every stain of sin. Also, as a consequence, her freedom from concupiscence, a disordered tendency which, according to the Council of Trent, comes from sin and is inclined to sin. Second, perfect use of reason. With a great divine light corresponding to the grace with which she was enriched. We may therefore believe that from the first moment when her pure soul was united to her most pure body, she was enlightened with divine wisdom to comprehend eternal truths, the beauty of virtue, above all, the infinite goodness of her God, and how much he deserves to be loved by all men, but especially by her on account of the peculiar graces with which he had adorned her and distinguished her from all creatures, preserving her from the stain of original sin, bestowing on her a grace so abundant, and destining her for the mother of the world and the queen of the universe. This was according to St. Alphonsus Liguori, which again he wrote in his book, Glories of Mary. Third, that the Immaculate Conception of Mary is a singular privilege which was never granted to another person, thus excluding the possibility maintained by some, but without foundation, of attributing this privilege also to St. Joseph. This singular grace is only granted by God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, that is, of His universal redeeming action. Christ was the Redeemer of His mother, and carried out his redemptive action in her in the most perfect way from the first moment of her existence. Fourth, Mary's birth is a prelude of the coming of the Savior and Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord. God decreed to have his begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to be born to Mary when she was 15. There is this ancient story in Magdeburg, a city of Saxony, about a certain man named Udo, who from his youth had been so destitute of talent that he was the ridicule of all his schoolmates. Now, one day, being more than usually disheartened, he went to pray to the Most Holy Virgin before her image. He stayed there for some time that Udo fell asleep. Mary then appeared to him in a dream and told him that because she had heard his prayers, she would do the following for him. First, she would come to console him. Second, she would obtain from God abilities which would protect Udo from derision. Third, we'll have talents which would be admired by all. And fourth, after the death of the bishop, she shall be elected in his place. And true enough, all these came to pass. Udo made great progress in sciences and became the bishop of the city. Unfortunately, with great sadness, Udo became ungrateful to God and to his benefactress, Mother Mary, for these favors that he neglected all his devotions and became a scandal of the place. While he was in bed one night with a pervert woman, he heard a voice saying to him, Udo, cease this sinful pastime. You have sinned enough. At first, Udo was irritated by these words, thinking it was from someone who was reproving him. But hearing it repeated a second and a third night, he began to tremble a little because he thought, what if the voice was from heaven? Udo's conscience began to act up, but still he continued in his wickedness. And after God had given him three months to repent, the horrific punishment came. One night, a devout canon named Frederick was in the church of St. Maurice, praying that God would remove the scandal which Udo had done. When behold, a strong wind burst open the church door and two youths entered with lighted torches in their hands and stood on each side on the high altar. Then two others followed, who spread before the altar a carpet 
and place upon it two thrones of gold. Another youth in military attire followed with sword in his hand, and stopping in the midst of the church, cried, O ye saints of heaven, whose relics are preserved in this church, come and assist at the great justice which the sovereign judge is about to execute. At these words, many saints appeared, and also the twelve apostles, as assistants in the judgment. Lastly, Jesus Christ entered and seated himself on one of these thrones. Afterwards, Mary appeared, attended by many holy virgins, and seated herself on the other throne at the side of her son. The judge now ordered that the culprit should be brought forward, and he was the miserable Udo. St. Maurice spoke and demanded in the name of the people whom he had scandalized justice for his infamous life. All present raised their voices and said, O Lord, he merits death. Then, in a booming voice, the eternal judge declared, Let him die then. But before the sentence was executed, see how great is the mercy of Mary. She, the kind mother, that she might not be present at the tremendous act of justice, left the church. And then the heavenly minister, who entered among the first with a sword, approached Udo, and with one blow, she bared his head from his body. The vision disappeared. The place was left dark. The cannon trembling went for the light from a lamp which was burning under the church. And when he returned, saw the body of Udo with the head cut off and the pavement all covered with blood. When daylight came, the people thronged to the church and the canon related the whole vision and the circumstances of the fearful tragedy. And on the same day, the wretched Udo, who was condemned to hell, appeared to one of his chaplains who knew nothing of what had taken place in the church. The body of Udo was thrown into the marsh and his blood remained for a perpetual memorial on the pavement which was always covered with a carpet. And from that time, it became the custom to uncover it when a new bishop took possession of the church, that at the sight of such a punishment, he might be mindful to lead a good life and not be ungrateful for the graces of the Lord and of his most holy mother. It is certain that the soul of Mary was the most beautiful soul that God ever created. And indeed, next to the incarnation of the Word, this work was the greatest and most worthy of Himself that the Omnipotent could accomplish in this Word, as St. Peter Damien terms it, which God alone excels, opus quod solus Deus supergreditur. Divine grace did not descend upon Mary in drops, as upon the other saints, but as David predicted, like rain upon the fleas, secret pluvia in bellus. The soul of Mary was like wool that happily imbibed all the great shower of graces without losing a drop. Saint Basil said that Mary drew to herself all the graces of the Holy Spirit. Saint Bonaventure further says, that Mary has the fullness what the other saints have in part. Speaking of Mary before her birth, Saint Vincent Ferrer said that Mary surpassed all the saints and angels in sanctity. The grace of the Blessed Virgin Mary surpassed the grace not only of each saint in particular, but all the saints and angels together Mary received from the first moment of her Immaculate Conception this special grace, superior to the grace of all the saints and angels together. To explain this, theologians provide two reasons. First, Mary was chosen by God to be the mother of the Divine Word. Blessed Dennis, the Cartusian says, that having been elected to an order superior to all creatures, for in the certain sense, the dignity of Mother of God belongs to the order of the hypostatic union. Her gifts of a superior order were justly bestowed upon her 
from the beginning of her life, so that her graces far exceeded those granted to all other creatures. And indeed, it cannot be doubted that at the same time, when in the divine decrees the person of the eternal word was predestined to become man, a mother was also destined for him, from whom he has to take the human nature, and this was our infant Mary. Now St. Thomas teaches, the Lord gives to every one grace proportion to that dignity for which he destines him. St. Paul taught this before when he said, Who also has made us fit ministers of the New Testament, signifying to us that the apostles received from God gifts proportioned to the great office to which they were elected. Now if Mary was chosen to be the mother of God, it was fitting that God should adorn her even from the first moment with an immense grace and of an order superior to the grace of all other men and angels. It being requisite that the grace should correspond with the most high and immense dignity to which God exalted her. Second, Mary is more holy than all the saints united because of the great office she had from the beginning as mediatrix of graces of man, which requires greater treasure of grace than the whole human race together. In Lumen Gentium, Article 62, the title of Mary as mediatrix was given and defined. It reads, Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked by the Church under the titles of Advocate, Auxiliatrix, Adjutrix, and Mediatrix. This, however, is to be so understood that it neither takes away from nor adds anything to the dignity and efficaciousness of Christ, the one Mediator. Since by her powerful intercession and merits, the congruo, she had obtained salvation for all, procuring from the ruined word, and take note, the great blessing of redemption. It is said by merit de congruo, because Jesus Christ alone is our mediator by way of justice, and by merit de condigno, as it is expressed by St. Thomas Aquinas and other scholastics, Jesus having offered to the eternal Father his merits, which he has accepted for our salvation. Mary, on the contrary, is the mediatrix of grace by way of simple intercession and of merit the congruo. She having offered to God, as St. Bonaventure says, her merits for the salvation of all men, and God, through grace, has accepted them in union with the merits of Jesus Christ. St. Alphonsus Ligori, quoting Arnold Carnotensis in The Glories of Mary, has this to say, Mary effected our salvation in common with Christ. A pastor of the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God in Brazil is smashed the statue of the Virgin Mary in the middle of a television broadcast. It was the statue of Our Lady of Aparecida, a major national shrine of Brazil. This honor and devotion to Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, is one of the many things rejected by Protestants. Protestants claim that the Catholic Church's devotion to Mary is not based on sacred scripture, that it is an offense to Christ, that no one should pray to Mary because there is only one mediator with the Father, and that Mary did not always remain a virgin. This last accusation is a byproduct of the assertion of the atheistic error of Russia that has spread all over the world with its unlimited sex and pleasure as the centerfold attraction. With a contraceptive lifestyle, babies are rarely welcome in favor of sexual pleasure without a child. No wonder the defamation of Mary's virginity is a major rallying cause of her detractors. There is a recorded account of Nestorius, together with his companions Doroteus, that after setting out Nestorius blaspheme against the Theotokos, Mary, mother of God. While Mary does not defend herself, Jesus, the son of Mary, Saint Joseph, the husband of Mary, and the Holy Spirit, 
the spiritual spouse of Mary, with God the Father, who made Mary his masterpiece and special daughter, always ready to defend Mary. After calling the historians for conversion and retraction of all the blasphemies he uttered in the past and present about the Virgin Mary, he remained obstinate. While God is merciful, if the person refuses to accept the mercy of God, then to save what could be lost, God exacts justice. Nestorius again blasphemed the mother of God, and as soon as he mounted his mule, like St. Paul, he fell off from it. And as he fell, he gave a loud cry as something sharp tore up his tongue from his mouth. This incident, however, did not stop Nestorius from being obstinate. He was still blaspheming against Mother Mary using his fingers. His severed tongue suddenly was infected by worms, eating away his entire mouth. Since obstinacy is a sin against the Holy Spirit as taught to us by John Paul II, we can understand how Nestorius was punished by God for being obstinate. Still journeying on the donkey, this time God struck down Nestorius and he fell off from his animal dead. Chronicles on this incident noted the putrefaction of Nestorius' limbs and especially his tongue while he was being moved from oasis to another location. It is also recorded that during Nestorius' burial, the earth refused to receive his corpse. All these accounts are contained in the ecclesiastical history of Evagrius Scholasticus translated by Michael Whitby and printed in 2000 by Liverpool University Press. Contrary to the modern culture, rejection of Mary and newborn babies in general, tradition depicts Saint Joachim and Saint Anne as loving and dedicated parents to their daughter Mary. They long to have a child. Religious artworks often show Mary on her mother's lap learning how to read. It is not hard to imagine that St. Joachim and St. Anne laid the groundworks for Mary's faith, preparing her for her answer to Angel Gabriel's announcement with a response, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. A model for marriage. Saints Joachim and Anne are the father and mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mary is the fruit of their marriage. By a singular grace of God in view of the marriage of Jesus, she was preserved from all stain of original sin from the moment of her conception. It is in the context of married life and conjugal love that Mary is prepared to receive the divine Logos, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the Logos, the reason, and the heart of all reason and truth including the truth of marriage. The struggling marriage between St. Joachim and Anne at the beginning is a significant witness why marriage is unique for a reason. Their suffering born in humility and total submission to God's will gave birth to the holiest creature in the whole world, chosen to become the mother of God. St. Joachim and St. Anne are the patron saints of grandparents and infertile couples. Amidst the contraceptive society, where pleasure is priority over the life of a newborn baby, a child born out of love and life between a legitimately married couple is a gift from God. A child is never an economic burden that must be received with gratitude and love. If parents would just fulfill their primary role of rearing children. Aside from mutual love, when the child grows, we have a future saint. In the case of Saints Anne and Joachim, who welcomed the child, they were gifted with the greatest reward for all mankind to be the parents of Mary, who in turn would be the mother of the Redeemer of the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. While Catholics worship only God, we venerate Mary because she is the mother of God. 
All the veneration we show to Mary, the Mother of God, is all found in the scripture and traditions. Let all creatures venerate Mary. Let us pray. O holy and heavenly infant Mary, you who are the destined mother of my Redeemer and the great Mediatrix of miserable sinners, have pity on me. Behold at your feet another ungrateful creature was recourse to you, and who implore your mercy. It is true that for my ingratitude to you and God, I deserve to be abandoned by you and my Lord. But I had been told, and therefore I believe, knowing how great is your compassion, that you will not refuse to help anyone who, with confidence, recommends himself to you. O most exalted of all creatures, since there is no one above you but God, and in comparison with you, the greatest in heaven are but small. O saint of saints, O Mary, the abyss of grace, full of grace, help a miserable sinner who has lost it by his own fault. I know you are so dear to God and that he denies you nothing. I also know that you rejoice to employ your greatness in relieving the distress. Make known how great is your favor with God by obtaining for me a divine light and a flame so powerful that it may change me from a sinner into a saint, and detaching me from every earthly affection may wholly inflame me with divine love. Do this for the love of that God who has made you so great, so powerful and merciful. This I hope to obtain from you to the most powerful intercession of the Blessed Mother of St. Joseph in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.